Good morning. We want to thank you for joining us for our online service from Unity Baptist Church in Champaign, Illinois, located at 404 South Duncan Road in Champaign. It's on the west side of town by Prairie Gardens. Uh, those in this area are very familiar with that uh, landmark. And uh, we're catty cornered from them and behind the Carpenters Union. So we would invite you to come and join us uh, for an in-person service that begins at 1015 every Sunday morning. We would love to have you. I invite your attention today once again to the book of Matthew chapter 24 verses 1 and 2. It's kind of our uh, base verse that I am I'm using for this brief series, and this will be the last message in that series. But uh, Christ has been in the temple. He has been talking and teaching. Uh, he has really scalded the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees uh, in the temple on this day. And as they're walking out of the temple, uh, the disciples are showing Christ all the buildings of the temple and and uh, how beautiful it was and and all the rest of it and and Christ kind of shocked them he he said in Matthew chapter 24 verses 1 and 2 he said as Jesus left and was going out of the temple his disciples came up and called his attention to the buildings and he replied to them do you see all these things Truly I tell you, not one stone will be left here on another that will not be thrown down. When my grandson and I were in Israel about two or three months ago, we saw the stones that are still laying next to the retention wall or retaining wall uh, there at the temple complex. And so the, the fulfillment of that prophecy that Christ made in Matthew chapter 24 and verse number two was fulfilled in 70 AD. And for these 2000 years, those stones have been laying there uh, as silent testimony to uh, the credibility of the prophecy and the viability of, of, the, of the words of Jesus Christ that the prophecy that he made would be fulfilled. And this, this particular uh, prophecy uh, gave the opportunity for the disciples to ask Christ some questions about the end times and, and gave Christ the opportunity uh, to launch into a, uh, a teaching about the end times and things that they need to be looking for. Not only they need to be looking for them, but we need to be looking for these things as well. I really believe that, that we live in what could possibly be considered uh, the most exciting time in the history of the world. I know everything's a mess, I understand that. But I think these are exciting times. It's a time in which biblical prophecies that were spoken of more than 2,600 years ago. Think of that, 2,600 years ago, these prophecies were made and they are on, in our day, they are on the precipice of being fulfilled just as they were prophesied about so many years ago. In the lifetime, of, of many of you who, who listen to this message today, there have been biblically significant events fulfilled in, in our lifetime that were prophesied about and, and, and predicted in the scriptures. Or, or things have happened that make the fulfillment of those uh, ancient prophecies possible. Let me give you some examples. On May the 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation for the first time in nearly 2,000 years. That is something that is go was going to have to happen for these end time prophecies to be fulfilled. On March the 25th, 1957, 
the European Common Market, also known as the European Economic Community, the European Union, was started. It is now known, as I said, as the European Union, but many Bible students believe that it represents the final form of the Roman Empire. You know, the Roman Empire never really was uh, uh, dissolved. It just kind of broke up into different pieces, as Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 2 talks about, as it talked about the kingdom of Babylon, and then Medo-Persia, and then Greece, and, and then Rome. And if you go back to that prophecy, the end of it is the feet of iron and clay, which is the end time uh, condition of the, of the Roman Empire. And this was predicted in Daniel chapter two. And uh, on July the 10th, 1962, some of you might remember this, I certainly do. The, the first Telstar satellite was launched into orbit. And you say, what in the world does that have to do with any Bible prophecy? Well, just this, it, the launching of Telstar made it possible for the first time in the history of the world for television, telephone, and telegraph images to be transmitted live throughout the world. And I remember hearing around that time uh, a pastor in my home church talk about this and how it related to uh, uh, the prophecy in Daniel chapter or in Revelation chapter 11 about the two witnesses in Revelation and that the whole world was going to see them rise from the, from the dead. Uh, that made it possible for that prophecy to be fulfilled. And before that time, people would think, you know, how in the world is that going to happen? For the, for the world to see it. Well, Telstar gave us an indication of how that can happen. On June the 7th, 1967, the Israeli army captured the old city of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. And that's important because both of those things are going to figure heavily, heavily in the end time battle of Armageddon, according to Zechariah chapters 12 through 14. And uh, this has been, those two things have been a point of contention ever since. And if you're paying any attention to anything that's going on in the world, you know that, that these are points of contention. The Temple Mount, the old city of Jerusalem, and also on June the 7th, 1967, that was the Six-Day War that Israel waged against its Arab neighbors. On that date, Israel began its occupation of the West Bank, which in Bible terms is Judea and Samaria. And that'll be one of the main battle sites uh, in the Battle of Armageddon, according to Zechariah chapter 12, verses two and three. Besides all of that, in Matthew chapter 24, Christ talks about there being pestilences. Now a pestilence is a fatal or epidemic disease. Now, somebody might say, you know what? There have always been pestilences, and that's true. There always have been. But the issue in the last days, uh, are, there are a couple of things about these things that Christ talks about, and that's one is frequency, and another is intensity. That's the way it's going to be in the tribulation period. Have there always been pestilences? Yes. But in, in the tribulation period, which Christ is talking about, uh, there, there are going to be more, and they're going to be more intense throughout the world. And so we've seen in our own day, uh, COVID-19, Ebola, uh, hepatitis, encephalitis, all of these uh, things that are going on in the world today, have they always gone on? Yes, but but they are increasing, that's the point, and will increase in the last days. 
this overall violence. There are wars and rumors of wars. We see this in our streets. We see it on our world. Just turn on the news. You'll see it in, in Brazil, in Mexico, in the Middle East, uh, in Ukraine, of course, and you see all of these wars and rumors of wars. There will be food shortages, famines, Jesus said. Could this include the supply chain? Uh, could it include possibly the buying up of farmland in, in America by foreign nations, particularly China? Could that be a part of this? It's very possible. There will be religious deception. Uh, false Christs, Jesus said. Has there ever been a time in the history of the world uh, when religious deception has been so rampant and, and accepted. And it's going on throughout our world right now. And the, the point that I'm making is that human history is moving toward a dramatic climax. And all of these things point to a time when each of these things and their importance to the end times will be mat magnified in a dramatic way. Now, I'm not here to predict when it's going to happen. I have no such knowledge. I don't know when the tribulation period is going to be. I don't know when the rapture of the church is going to be before the tribulation. It could happen today. It might happen 100 years from now. I'm not trying to set any dates. I'm not trying to make any predictions. What I'm trying to alert us to is that God is at this moment setting the stage for this dramatic conclusion to human history and, and the end of time as we know it. These things that we've talked about will come into full bloom during the tribulation period. But the point that I'm making is that they are stirring now and it is just impossible for me to talk about each one of them and how they relate to the end time events. But I, because there are so many things going on in the world right now that relate to what the Bible talks about. I do think it's important to, to us as believers to be aware of what's going on, uh, for us to know the terminology that is being used, which sounds good on the surface, but it conceals a, a hidden goal and hidden motives on the part of those who are pushing these different things. Let me give you some examples. According to financial blogger Sorel Amor, terms like the Great Reset, the Fourth Industrial Revolution, the Great Narrative, are very important for us. Now, this lady, as far as I know, is not at all speaking from a Christian perspective. She is just warning us that these things are taking place and these movements are taking place. Her concern is finances. Her concern is the financial world. My concern is the biblical world. What does the Bible say? And when those two things are are. I guess you could say coordinating or they are on the same track, I think it's important for us to look. She's not looking at this from a spiritual standpoint, to my knowledge at least, but she does think it's important for all of us, not just Christian people, but for all of us to be aware of these things and what they mean, what they portend for us individually and for the world as a whole, and as a believer in Christ, how they relate to what the Bible has prophesied. She, she says that, she would, that we should also be aware of programs like uh, the CBDC, which is the Central Bank Digital Currencies, and why that is important to, in relation to the Bible is because in that particular program or movement or whatever you want to call it, the central government becomes the banker. And, and the idea is that no one will know any, own anything 
the government will control everything. It becomes the banker. It determines what the individual's needs are from the data that they have gathered about us. The government will meet those needs and it will cut off someone who is not complying. It will cut off uh, their supply altogether. It's about control. And she tells us that, that this banking system is fully traceable. They can trace everything about us. Int integral to, to that kind of control is a scoring system that is known as ESG. It stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. And it's a scoring system which scores corporations in terms of their compliance with the modern woke agenda. So people who are wanting to invest in a company can go uh, to a, a particular site or a scoring agency like ESG and see what the score of this country, uh, a company is in terms of their environmental stance. How are they in relation to the environment? How are they as far as social things are concerned? Are they on the right page socially? And you know, are, are they into all these social movements? Are they helping them? And, and governance? Are they complying to government mandates? And, and they, they score them and there are benefits for compliance and potential punishments for non-compliance. You know, the interesting thing about all these things is that, is that they are separate entities, but they all have the same goal. And the same goal is centralized control of our lives. Eventually, according to the Bible and the prophecies in the Word of God, though that control will be under the rule of one man, known in, Bible, in the Bible as the Antichrist. How is a centralized government going to keep up with everything you and I do? every purchase that we make, how are they going to do that? And we ask the question, is it, is it possible to, to implement a system that will track every activity, every purchase, and every relationship in my life? Is that possible? Well, yes, it is. In fact, the Bible talks about this tribulation eventuality, at least in one aspect, in Revelation 13, verses 11 through 18, in which the Antichrist, we have to receive his mark. A person has to receive his mark on their right hand or their forehead before they can buy or purchase anything. So let's talk about the mark in Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 18. Revelation, the 13th chapter, verses 11 through 18. Let me get over there here in just a second and, and read this. Revelation chapter 13, beginning at verse number 11, says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and this, this particular beast uh, is not the Antichrist, it is the false prophet, said it had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all authority of the first beast on its behalf, and the first beast is the Antichrist, and compels the earth and those who live on it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. It also performs great signs, even causing the fire to come down from heaven to earth in front of people. 
It deceives those who live on the earth because of the signs that it is permitted to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who live on the earth to make an image of the beast or the Antichrist, who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. It was permitted to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast could both speak and cause whoever would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And it makes everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, which is the beast's name or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, because it is the number of a person. Its number is six 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 now i don't know of anything else in the bible that intrigues people more than than this number it has for centuries been the subject of speculation no one knows exactly what it is some have speculated that that three is the number of God, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in, the, in biblical numerology. Uh, and six is the number of man uh, created on the sixth day, and it's the number of man. So, so that's a, a subtle claim or an acceptance of the Antichrist as being God. That's one theory, one speculation. Uh, but again, it's, it's all speculation, but it is associated with buying and selling. Some have suggested that it might be a tattoo, uh, but how many people are going to want to get a tattoo in the middle of their forehead or, or even on their uh, right hand? Uh, not very many, I would suggest. In recent years, the, the microchip has been uh, suggested as a possibility. Uh, on August the 9th, uh, 2017, Jefferson Graham, a columnist for USA Today, wrote an article entitled, You Will Get Chipped Eventually. And, and the point of the article is that it's coming, that we're going to be chipped. And uh, what I noticed in, in watching this was that it was the right hand where the chip was going to be placed. You know, markings on, on, on the body are becoming more and more acceptable, and it's not out of the realm of possibility to, for people to accept a mark at government direction in order to buy and sell. I mean, on a practical standpoint, it makes great sense. Uh, you don't have to carry credit cards. You don't have to carry a driver's license. Uh, it would be a way to uh, possibly track people. It could keep your medical records uh, on your body. You become your own credit card and all of those kinds of things. So the question is, is this, what's going on in the world right now, is this a part, a process in which people will be programmed to accept a device or some kind of mark I, I think it is. We're going through this. Now, what we do know is that this mark and about this mark is that it will be personally associated with the Antichrist. It is the number of his name. It will be a sign of, of personal allegiance to him. And, and, and somehow this number is going to identify for people who the Antichrist is. And, you know, over the years, there's been much speculation. I, I mean, uh, Napoleon was the Antichrist. Hitler was the Antichrist. Stalin, Mao Zedong, uh, uh, you know, Richard Nixon, uh, <laughs> you name it. Uh, per, uh, Henry Kissinger, pretty much everybody has been uh, nominated for Antichrist, but this number is going to identify him. It's going to be socially, uh, uh, I mean, it's going to be associated 
with him so personally that it will identify who the Antichrist is. And people who accept that mark, it will seal their personal and eternal doom. We live in a time when people's compliance with government directives, whatever those directives are, are quickly obeyed. And I, I think the last couple of years have shown us that. And there is going to come a time in the tribulation period when an all-powerful government leader is going to demand that people take the mark of the beast or the mark of the Antichrist or the number of his name or you will not eat anything, you will not buy anything, you will not sell anything, you will not be able to make money, you will not be able to go anywhere unless you have this mark. Uh, we were in uh, Tel Aviv and at the airport and we went up to, it was boarding and we went up and the guy stopped us my grandson and I, and he said, uh, where is your mask? I said, I have no mask. He said, then you can't board this plane. And I said, well, where am I gonna get a mask? He said, well, he said, I don't know, but uh, you're not gonna board this plane without a mask. And it impressed upon me how, how a government edict can pretty much stop it anything. Thank God there were people there who had extra masks who gave me and my grandson one. But we weren't getting on that plane. And I'd, I'd still be sitting in the airport in Tel Aviv if, if I hadn't been able to get a mask because it was required. And for 15 hours, much to my chagrin, I, I wore a mask till I got back to Chicago. I mean, this kind of thing we are seeing even today. The people at that time of the tribulation period who do not know the Lord, and we're not in the tribulation period, but the point that I'm making is that we are seeing these kinds of things take place now. And when the church is raptured out, and when the restraint of sin is removed, as 2 Thessalonians says it will be, when the Holy Spirit no longer restrains sin, when these things are implemented, as God says they will be during the tribulation period, we can see them beginning to stir right now. And the people at that time who do not know the Lord are going to take this sign, this mark, of the Antichrist, because in the atmosphere of those times that are coming, the only thing that's going to matter is personal survival. Let me, let me talk about a couple of other things in closing today. Considering these things, how then should we live? As a believer, if you're a believer in Christ, you're not going to be here uh, to see these things in full bloom. You'll not see the Antichrist. You're not going to have to worry about taking the mark if you are a believer in Christ. And the reason for that is because you will already have been raptured out. The Lord will come back and, and will take his people with him to heaven. That's what the scriptures teach. But how should we live right now? We see these things right now beginning to stir in our world today. Well, Peter talks about this in, in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 11. And he says there, since all these things, and he's just talked about the events that are going to take place in the end times, and he says, since all these things are to be dissolved, all this material world is going to be burnt up. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct 
and godliness as you wait for the day of God and hasten its coming. So what kind of people should we be? The dilemma for the believer in Christ has always been how we respond to this kind of stuff. Those with a biblical worldview often uh, speak often of the condition of the world and how we as believers are to fit into that world. Should, should the reality of these things, we see these things taking place, we know what they pretend, we know what, what is coming, should that depress us? Should it discourage us? Should it cause us, as the world becomes darker and darker, should it, it draw us back in fear and, and cause us to try to hide from the realities that we see in our world, since it seems that we are having no impact or little impact whatsoever? That's what a lot of believers do. Maybe that's what you're doing. They want to get out of here. They want to be done with this mess that we know is the world. I understand that sentiment because I've had it myself at times. But is that the right view of our role in a world system that is passing away? Is that how we ought to view this? You know, the end is coming. Let it come. Get me out of here. Or, or should we take another view? Several years ago, I, I read a sermon by Charles Spurgeon, the great uh, British pastor of the 1850s, 60s, and 70s, and so on. And in that message, Spurgeon said that it is wrong. It's a wrong perspective for the believer to desire Christ to come back just so they can be relieved of the burdens of this world. He said, that's the wrong perspective. And that puzzled me, but I took his point. I think he's right. I agree with that. I think that's the wrong perspective. The Lord didn't save us and leave us here so we could sit around wishing we could escape the assignment he's given us while we are here. He left us here for an eternal purpose. And that eternal purpose is to be like Christ and to live out Christ's life in a world that is increasingly hostile to the gospel. Now, now we live in America and we don't see it as much or as intensely as they see it in other countries, but we live in a world that is hostile to the gospel. They don't want to hear it. The dis but, but we have to understand that the descending darkness only enables the light of Christ in us to shine through us more brightly. The increasing corruption only allows his transformational power in the life of the individual to be more evident in their life in that kind of an atmosphere. Paul tells us, or Peter tells us in these verses, that in light of what the Bible is telling us, it is clear how we ought to live, not how we can escape, but how we ought to live and the kind of people that we should be. So let me share with you in closing three characteristics every believer ought to demonstrate in their lives in light of these things. First of all, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 7. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 7. Listen to what Paul says to Timothy. He says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. First thing we ought to keep in mind as we live in this world, as believers in Christ, and we see what is going on, we are to live boldly. If you read the letters of Paul to Timothy, uh, you come to the conclusion that Timothy had a boldness problem. 
And Paul was prompted in this last communication to Timothy before he died to confront Timothy about it. He was a young pastor in what was arguably the most prominent church in the world of that time. And there were apparently people in the church who thought Timothy was too young to be their pastor, to hold such a position. And others in the church that, that Timothy had to deal with were just a pain in the neck. And, and Timothy was intimidated, and he allowed his fear of those who opposed him in the church to keep him from accomplishing the very purpose God had in saving him. We, too, can look at the state of the world around us, the growing hatred for righteousness, the rejection of a biblical ethic, and, and we can look at all of these things and the disruption and the chaos in the world and we can cower in fear and we, we can close our mouths and we can try to maneuver our way through the world without being noticed. But is that what God wants? Is that what he wants from you and me? Well, Peter says, or T Paul said to Timothy, that kind of spirit does not come from the Lord. God has not given us that. He's not given us a spirit of fear. He has given us a spirit of power and of love and of sound judgment or a sound mind, as the King James says. We have been given the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. We have been given the power of the Holy Spirit that he has bestowed upon us to be his witnesses. And we have been given, according to 2 Corinthians, we have been given the mind of Christ to help us view the happenings around us through the eyes of God. Not through the eyes of our fears, but through the eyes of of God. And when we surrender these gifts that God has given to us, when we surrender those things to our fears, when we bow down to the, before these uh, intimidations because we are fearful, then we be, bring disgrace to our Savior and we forfeit our purpose as believers in the world. And so the first admonition to us in view of these things is to live boldly. We have God's commission, we have God's power, we have God's presence, and we face an enemy who is already defeated. Live boldly. Look at all that's going on. It's horrible, we understand that, but live boldly because we serve the Lord Christ. Secondly, we are to live expectantly. Titus chapter 2 and verse number 13. Let me flip over there just a couple of pages if you have your Bible with you. Titus chapter 2 and verse number 13. While we wait for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Live expectantly. When I was in, in California many years ago on staff, there was a man on staff with me who kept a little plaque on his desk in his office, and all it said was, perhaps today. It has always reminded me that this is the way the believer ought to live his life in this world, to live every day with the expectation that Christ could come today. That expectation ought to so grip our life that every word we speak, every action we take, every thought we think, every motivation of our heart is filtered through that expectation 
expectation. Jesus may come today. Do you think that would change the way we live? Would it stop our critical spirit? Would it put an end to our gossipy tongue? Would it bring a halt to our lustful eyes or our actions of betrayal? Would it stop our unkindnesses toward those we see as our rivals? Would it, would it put a stop to our hateful tones? Would it stop our lack of devotion to Christ and his church? If I lived expectantly, if I thought that Jesus was coming in the next minute, the next hour, would it change the way I live my life? I think it would. But I will say this, if, if living in that expectation, if adopting that expectation, if I say to myself, if I knew Christ was coming in the next five minutes, 10 minutes, and it radically changed my life, then there is something wrong with my life. The Apostle John's admonition to us in 1 John 2.28 is appropriate here. He said, and now little children abide in him, that when he shall appear, and, and the word abiding has the implication of obedience, obeying the word of God, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. To live obediently, to live submissively, is to live with confidence because when we stand before Christ, we will not be ashamed because we have obeyed. Are we living our lives today with that expectancy? And then I want us to consider finally that we are to live in holiness. In 1 John chapter 3, and verses two and three. The Apostle John is writing to this church, we assume, 1 John chapter three, verses two and three. He's writing to this church and he talks to them about their relationship with the Lord. And he says, dear friends, we are God's children now and what we will be has not been revealed. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. In virtually every New Testament passage that talks about Christ's return, it is either preceded by or followed by an admonition concerning the way we are to live our lives in light of that fact. Jesus is coming, therefore, this is how you ought to live. My point is that God is concerned about how we live our lives. Whatever is happening around us, God is concerned about how we live our lives as a believer in Christ. And so however near or far Christ's coming may be, and that coming is always imminent, we are to be concerned as God is about how we live our life. And, and Paul, and then again in 2 Peter 3, talks about living in holiness and godliness. We live in the last, this is my belief, we live in the last of the last days. That is serious and eternal business. 
The question for all of us is whether or not we are ready. Have we made our peace with God through Christ in salvation? Have we come to the place of repentance and faith? Have we turned from our sin and, and followed Christ? If not, then I appeal to you to make sure you know Christ, to make sure that you are in a right relationship with him because Jesus is coming. Father, I pray that you will bless this message. All these things going on in the world around us can be very frightening, especially when we know the truth of your word and what your word says to us about the end times. We see these things unfolding before us. We see them happening. And help us not to respond in fear, but, but help us to be confident, help us to live holy lives, help us to live expectantly. And if there's one listening today who does not know you as Savior and Lord, help them today to turn from their sin and receive Christ into their life and the work that he did by himself, the Bible says. Him alone, he alone has taken care of this complete salvation that you are ready to give anyone who will come to you in repentance of sin and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. May that be so in every life today, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today. God bless you and have a wonderful day.